The following interview was conducted with Fred Ford, Executive Vice President and Treasurer Emeritus for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, September 11, 2007 at in the TV studio in Stewart Center. The interviewer was Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and early years and education through high school. Well, I was born and raised 50 miles north of here in Kentland and went through grade school there and then moved to a, a farm outside of Brook in uh, junior high in a little school called Forsman, a little town, and uh, high school in Brook. Uh, my uh, father was a Purdue civil engineer, and uh, most of his career was spent with the uh, State Highway. My mother was a DePaul graduate in music and art, and uh, she taught for a while, but after kids came along, uh, she was a full-time mother. And uh, my both my grandparents on both sides were there in Kentland, so I grew up with a big family around and ended up living on the family farm, uh, the Means property, which was from my mother's side of the family. And, uh, Tell us a little bit about the farm. What was stupid did you have well, on the farm? Well, it, it was... Uh, uh, a farmstead that started when my great-great-grandfather bought it from the government and uh, it turned out it had limestone on it so most of the farm is now a hole where they dug out the limestone and we have very little left at this okay. point but we've got a few acres there. Sure. And, uh, Do you have any crops on there at all? or Yes, or uh, corn and beans mostly. Okay. And, okay. Uh, it was uh, an interesting period of time in the early 50s uh -huh. when I was there. And uh, um, a nice place to be from, but uh, my father made it clear that um, <clears throat> I was going to be a Purdue engineer. <laughs> and he didn't care which kind, I got to choose which kind. I chose mechanical engineering, so in 1954 I uh, came to Purdue as a freshman, lived in the DU fraternity house and uh, spent four years there and uh, graduated in mechanical engineering. I spent a couple of summers working uh, at the uh, guide lamp division of General Motors in Anderson, Indiana. And uh, coming from the farm, I had never been in a factory before, <laughs> so that was quite an experience. And, uh, after two summers of that, I decided I was really more interested in management, and I had taken a course from Professor John Day in management and uh, liked it. And uh, they were just starting the new MSIA program, and so I applied and fortunately was uh, accepted and uh, said goodbye to General Motors and came back to school and in the meantime got married and uh, by the time I'd gotten part way through the program I decided this was really it. And if a little bit's good then a whole lot's better. So I went on for the PhD okay. and uh, during the master's program uh, Lytle Freehafer who was then business manager and assistant treasurer and of course of Freehafer Hall fame, uh, came and addressed the class and told us a little bit about managing a university, which nobody had ever thought of before. And uh, <clears throat> somehow it struck a chord with me, and so uh, later on I followed up with him. And when I decided to go on to graduate school, uh, I talked to John Day about it, and. He suggested I chat with Lytle and see what the opportunities might be, and uh, Lytle said this would be a good experiment, see if people from the Cranert, what, it was not Cranert then, but is now Cranert, Cranert School might be able to do in a university environment. And This was something new that they hadn't So could. it was a brand new 
experiment and uh, I was the guinea pig and I spent a year while I was in graduate school. Uh, one of the nice things about working at a university, you, get, you can take formal classes. You can take two classes per semester. So I worked full time and uh, took two classes and uh, went through kind of a training program and then when I got through I served as his administrative assistant and that was just at the time that R.B. Stewart was retiring. So Lytle Freefer became vice president and treasurer and uh, I became an administrative assistant to the vice president and treasurer by virtue of that change and uh, <coughs> continued that until I finished my Ph.D. in 1964 and uh, then I uh, fully expected to leave uh, prior to that, but uh, I had fallen in love with the University Business Administration and uh, they made me an offer which was sufficient to keep me there. And uh, uh, John Hicks was also a major player in that by then and President Hovde. And uh, <clears throat> I became uh, assistant business manager uh, in my first real full-time position after graduating. And then later, uh, Francis Finn, who was the business manager, decided to go to Nakubo in Washington as their executive director. And uh, Lytle promoted me to be business manager and assistant treasurer in 1969. <clears throat> then, uh, Four years later, uh, Lytle decided uh, I'd had enough training and he could retire and I was fortunate enough to be promoted to vice president and treasurer and then the next year they changed the title to executive vice president and treasurer, changed the academic side to executive vice president and provost. And uh, so as chief business officer and chief academic officers, we were the two operating uh, members of the management team reporting to the president. Mm -hmm. That was under President Hanson. Okay. May I ask a question? What was campus like when you were a student here in the 50s and early 60s? Well, we Wasn't had about 11 or 12,000 students, so okay. it was different. I was the last class, last freshman class to be allowed to have cars on campus which led to my uh, eventual marriage to somebody who needed a car <laughs> at an opportune time. <clears throat> but uh, it was very quiet. People were uh, focused on getting their education and uh, not that we didn't play around and have fun, but... Right. Um, Here's some of the uh, Korean people were coming. The Korean War was over, they were coming back. Uh, were there a some little of bit, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had people in my class from on the GI Bill uh -huh. and some in the DU house that, where I lived uh, uh, that were from that. Um, I stayed in graduate school and never was drafted, but sure. it, just pure timing. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> it exactly. was over at the that's right, right time Exactly, for me. that's right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And of course, the village was, has changed over time, too, oh, hasn't yes. it? Uh, um, of course, Harry's was the only place that served alcohol in West Lafayette, and uh, the village was the only commercial area in West Lafayette, and there was no bus system. Apartments meant upstairs of an old house. <laughs> These are things I'm learning from the people yeah. that was housing, yeah, even the ones different. that came back after the war, yeah. there was not much of anything. Oh, it was they much had the worse black then. And white. Yeah. yeah, I yeah, understand. Yeah, the black and whites. I've heard, learned airport. about those too. Oh, yes. <laughs> this has been a learning of Some of the temporary well. residence halls that they had too sure. uh, were still there when I came. But they were phased out the, quickly. The, creative, uh, the one where the Creative Arts was, was uh, built when you came, wasn't it? Or it was already here, wasn't it? It was the one here. Where yes. Armstrong yeah. is going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. The, I, the last one <laughs> to go. <laughs> I spent my whole career planning to tear those down. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? <laughs> were there, there must have been some thoughts over time, is that? Well, they, they were, uh, they served a very useful purpose. Uh, right. 
thousands and thousands of people like me uh, took chemistry there, uh, freshman chemistry. And, uh, but uh, in the summer they were hot and in the winter they were cold and right. they just, uh, creative arts had them at the end and they liked them from a certain standpoint because they didn't have to worry about messiness and getting paint on the walls and stuff. <laughs> but um, It was a studio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But that was one of my last projects was to get uh, the Creative Arts Building uh, authorized by the legislature so uh -huh. we could tear those temporary buildings down. Right. And at that time, I had no idea what would go there, sure. but it was just a matter of getting rid of those temporary buildings that were built in 1946 or Something, seven. That's what they say around yeah. that time. Yeah. Yeah. Interestingly, President Hansen was a student at Purdue at that time and helped build those temporary buildings. Uh, That's an interesting yeah. side life, yeah. Well, now the Executive Vice President of Treasury of many responsibilities, as you well know, and or shared and everything. So I thought we'd talk a little bit about some of them. How about the budget for the operating budget? Uh, how does that come about? Thinking of, with, I'm gearing these to thinking of the researchers who are going to be benefiting by many of the activities and things that you were involved in. Well, the <clears throat> the budget at that time, as I recall, was in the forty or fifty million dollar range. Um, a high percent, relatively high percent, was provided by the state, and then uh, sponsored research and all the other uh, self-supporting enterprises uh, constituted the rest of it. Um, Purdue is a, a very organized university, and I, I think it's because of our science and engineering background. So <clears throat> the Board of Trustees has a set of bylaws, and uh, in those bylaws they outline responsibilities. And <clears throat> Purdue is also kind of unique in its organization, and I don't know exactly why it's set up this way, but it's functioned very nicely. Uh, the treasurer of the university is also the treasurer of the board of trustees. Mm -hmm. And the trustees in their bylaws set forth what the responsibilities of the treasurer will be. And uh, that uh, budget is one of them. Uh, I had overall responsibility for development of the budget, but obviously the academic areas had to have major input and, and the president as a supervisor overall. Uh, I reported as treasurer to the president on a day-to-day -day basis, but to the trustees also as treasurer of the board of trustees. So I had two bosses and mm -hmm. uh, that some people say won't work, but it did oh, work yeah. very nicely. Sure. Yeah. All depends on the people. Right. They play a big role. That's right. <laughs> and. And the important part, I think, in the budget preparation was getting the right input from all of the people, uh, developing guidelines which were realistic and, and keeping the Board of Trustees uh, informed uh, along the way because ultimately they had to approve it. And uh, uh, student fees have always played a big part in the financing of the budget. and. Uh, as state uh, appropriations kind of uh, waned at various times during recessions, then we'd try to make up part of it with student fees. And uh, no matter what the makeup of the board was, there were always at least two or three board members that were super concerned about not getting the uh, student fees too high uh, that we would price uh, people with lower income uh, category out of the market and out of Purdue. And uh, so we always took a very conservative approach. Uh, one of my responsibilities in the budget was to estimate the income side of it. And we were always very careful that we didn't become too rosy in our outlook. Right. Uh, and uh, that over the long term has served Purdue pretty well. Oh, I'm mm -hmm. sure, right. 
And then uh, the administration of contracts, you sort of were involved in that to some yes. extent. Yes, the fiscal um, side of the sure. contracts, uh, uh, all of the sponsored programs, uh, even to this day, are administered through the Purdue Research Foundation and uh, Vice President for Research. And, and the deans, of course, are the people that day to day are involved and mm -hmm. department heads. And uh, that's where the greatest part of the day to day management takes place sure. in a university is at the dean's level and the department heads level. Um, the academic vice president, who for a number of years uh, was also dean of the graduate school, because um, the two are very closely linked together. Um, and tied in with that was intellectual property and, and all of that. And uh, we worked with uh, uh, programs in, in Washington, D.C., lobby groups, if you will, uh, Committee on, Counts uh, on Government Relations was one of my uh, activities uh, where they uh, tried to work with the various agencies on the rules and regulations, uh, uh, focused on both the academic as well as the financial side of uh, sponsored program mm -hmm. administration. So it was a program that has grown continuously, and I'm just amazed at the level at which it's Gone, gone to uh, since I retired. Sure. <laughs> Do you have uh, you had contacts with the PRF too as well? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's part of that. The thing. the treasurer of PRF is a quarter time employee of the treasurer of the university. Okay. Good. So the two are linked together in that way by uh, simply tradition. The president of the university serves as president of the Purdue Research Foundation. Mm -hmm. So uh, in Purdue's long history, the Purdue Research Foundation has never gone off in a direction that was in conflict with the university. That's not true in other universities around the country, uh, one which we could name it to the south, for example. Um, but it served us very well. Right. So there are a number of things that are forefathers did uh, very astutely. <laughs> and put in place and continue right, right on, right, yes. You know, the um, management of the properties and the funds, you're involved in that, that was one of the responsibilities? Yes, uh, you might want to Purdue Research it. Foundation okay. really was the main uh, conduit for real estate, and uh, the Research Foundation uh, over the years has one of its greatest contributions has been through research, uh, real estate. Uh, they acquired properties, uh, particularly to the west of the campus, as they came on the market long before all the student apartments started sure. to crop up. And uh, <clears throat> eventually when the university needed it, then they turned it over to the university at a cost which was their net cost at the time the property was turned over. So if they had a piece of property that they operated for a long time, like an old house that was rented, uh, it might be paid off, and so it would come to the university for free. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was a great advantage. Uh, investments, uh, the treasurer's responsible for investments. Uh, by state statutes, as a matter of fact, and in addition to the bylaws of the trustees. And uh, R.B. Stewart really uh, hired William Blair and Company from Chicago as an investment advisor, and they continued to be our investment advisor all through my tenure as treasurer. Uh, when I took over in 1974, uh, stock market was not in good shape. Uh, I think the Dow was something like 700, and uh, <clears throat> the uh, endowment was uh, about 50-50 bonds and equities, and uh, about $50 million in total. Uh, 
25 years later, it was $1.3 billion, and it was about 80 percent in equities. Mm -hmm. So uh, things changed considerably, and a, a good deal of that was simply the market right. that took place and mm -hmm. changed. And, right. and the changing the asset mix from 50-50 equities and bonds to 80-20 equities uh, uh, allowed us to grow it. And sure. we, could, we had that luxury because um, the endowment has always been a supplement, uh, kind of an extra bonus for people, not uh, something that they had to have every year to live sure. on. So uh, we were able to take that luxury and um, we changed the policy to a total return concept so we could spend part of the capital appreciation as well as uh, interest income and dividends, and that too helped the recipients. So uh, there are a lot of endowments that uh, people made a gift to the university, and it, it might have been uh, a few hundred thousand dollars originally, and now it's many millions of dollars, and quite different. Wise investment, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> uh, um, and we talked a little bit about investments. One of the things that uh, came to come across yes was remember in the 80s about South Africa and about the divestment, right. and there was quite right. a bit of controversy on that. Yes, there among other, not only at Purdue but many other schools, yeah. and we just held on. And we we stayed the course with our investments, and we said um, <clears throat> we should make investment policies based on the best financial. Uh, information we had and not make political decisions for our investments because right. we're really managing other people's money. Right, and, exactly. Uh, we didn't think we had the responsibility to uh, or the authority to uh, make, make political statements out of their money, so right. we did not. Right, okay. The residence halls, mm -hmm. they're self supporting, and you try right. to maintain a balance between the rates and, and the operating costs. All right. That's a challenge, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and then try course, to build new ones, right? Yes, <laughs> and <laughs> renovate the old ones right. <laughs> as well. Oh, yes. Um, and of course, the residence hall system, there are a number of things at Purdue that <clears throat> go back to <clears throat> R.B. Stewart's genius, and one of them is the residence hall system. Um, he developed uh, debt financing for residence halls. Um, you want to elaborate nationally. on that term so researchers, when they hear that, on the t they'll what debt financing? What? Yeah, Go. that is selling bonds to uh, finance the construction. Up to then, people had used gift income primarily to finance uh, uh, residence halls. So. Uh, Cary Hall, of course, had some gift income from, from the family. Cary family, but uh, R.B. Stewart got the legislature to pass a, a bill which uh, authorized uh, Purdue to sell bonds, their uh, income revenue bonds, and uh, they were tax exempt, and there was a good market for them, and uh, that's how all of our residence halls have been financed. And uh, the residence halls have always been a part of the financial side of the university because they've been operated as a business. And uh, Jack Smalley and I developed a formula for putting aside money for renovations so that we took about 9% of the revenue that was generated and set it up in reserves so that we could, on a continuous basis, renovate the older residence halls and, and keep them as current as we could. And it's interesting now that Cary Hall, the first residence hall that was built, is now, they tell me, in the highest demand from the students because it's been renovated and air conditioned and it's closest to the academic campus. Right. You can get up late and still make it to class right. in the morning. Right. <laughs> and I, th I will also say, a compliment to you and your wife, the 
dining hall. That's very nice. Yes, that was uh, nice of the trustees to name that. That's interest. quite nice. And yeah. uh, I've been there a couple of times. It yeah. really is quite nice. Yeah, we're almost tempted to go back and be students again. <laughs> it wasn't that way when we were in school. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't they have that, right? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> but the the residence halls, um, there's only been a couple of new ones over time, even during mm -hmm. yours, there haven't been very, the renovation very is a big thing, yeah. though, isn't it, yeah. you said? Yeah, a lot of the growth was taking place while I was in undergraduate and graduate school, all of the uh, so-called H1 and H2 sure. and H3 and H4 and so on, um, Owen Hall, Tarkington Hall and so on were built, and uh, uh, Hillenbrand was the major one that uh, that I built, Shreve Hall also, uh -huh. at the tail end of the Freehafer era and the beginning of my time, um, and then the graduate houses, which were built really under Lytle Freehafer. Uh, so, uh, was and since Mary, then, there's not been Mary a lot. Student Housing was already here when that was built. What? It, it was. We kept adding to oh, it. Okay. And uh, and now we're subtracting from it. <laughs> right. Exactly. With Discovery Park and so forth. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, the communities changed considerably. And when Mary Student Housing was originally built, uh, a lot of them out by the airport were built as kind of temporary facilities and 50 years later they're still there <laughs> <laughs> right. and still serving a, a very good purpose right. for students who need low-cost housing right and that's that's where the university uh, married student housing is at the low end of the uh, totem pole and uh, the private market serves the middle and upper end mm -hmm. and that's that worked out fine sure, that's right uh, there certainly has been a growth of apartments within the community. Oh, yes. It's, Maggie. Maggie. We, <clears throat> we didn't want to build additional residence halls because we thought the enrollment was going to drop off. And all the projections based on number of births and everything uh, said that they were going to. So we set about to... Uh, promote building private apartments, which could be used by students, but others as well. So if enrollment dropped off, people could rent them to others. And well, it turned out the projections were wrong. The birth rates increased, and and uh, the enrollment has done almost nothing to but go up. Right. And uh, But it took a lot of work to get the uh, private uh, people interested. Uh, the first ones were the bricks, the brownstones over there on uh, Waldron, um, and uh, PRF was involved in, in sort of helping and making land available at a reasonable price and so on to get that done. And uh, once the pump got primed, then it really took off and, <laughs> and actually overshot, <laughs> as you no, and there are a number of vacancies now, they tell mm -hmm. me, so. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's, but it has been interesting. Yeah. <laughs> How about the tuition increases? That's always a challenge, isn't it? You sort of addressed yeah. that a little bit before. It's, it's yeah, hard. it's always a tough decision right. between what you have to have in order primarily to give uh, faculty and staff reasonable salary increases and, and to uh, uh, take care of the uh, equipment budgets and things for uh, the various schools and uh, and as I said earlier we always have had uh, two or three trustees that have uh, led the charge on keeping in, uh, fees low uh, their priorities primarily for uh, okay. Indiana residents as opposed to non-residents and as a result even today, Purdue's uh, fees for in-state students, I think, rank in the bottom two or three of the Big Ten. Uh, right. Iowa. They maintain that. Right. And uh, it always irked us a little bit that IU's fees were a little higher than ours, but no trustees would never 
allow us to increase them enough to <laughs> overtake them. <laughs> uh, how about intercollegiate activities? You know, you got some contacts with them too, right? Yes, uh, I, the treasurer always has fiscal responsibility over all operations, so uh, my uh, concern was with their fiscal operations, and, and actually they have a, uh, a business manager, uh, have had for a long time, uh, as a part of the organization that reported both to the uh, director of intercollegiate athletics as well as the business side. And uh, we have tried to keep them. They are self-supporting. And uh, there are no state monies that have ever gone into Purdue Intercollegiate Athletics. Uh, students pay a small fee and in return for that get tickets to, uh, used to be tickets to everything. Now, uh, as the financial crunch came along, they pay half price, I think, still for uh, football and basketball tickets, but they get free admission to everything else. And uh, we've had uh, very good directors of intercollegiate athletics over the years, and they've managed things well. And so we've never uh, had a time when we've accumulated a big debt or anything. We've been uh, always uh, very careful to keep our expenses within our revenues, and uh, uh, particularly Morgan Burke, who's done more than anybody else, and he's been a fantastic uh, manager of intercollegiate athletics and built and remodeled uh, our facilities in a way that I never would have dreamed possible. And every time I see him, he assures me that he's building reserves and in a good shape to because they go through cycles, and, and oh, yes. you can't win forever. <laughs> and sooner or later, things happen that, that you don't win, and as soon as you stop winning, then attendance goes down, and then the revenue goes down. And, uh, that can be a problem. That's very hard to predict. Some, uh, some of our other institutions in the Big Ten uh, have not fared so well. <laughs> exactly. That's right. Yeah. Uh, the Purdue and the Lafayette community, the town and town, you've already yeah. been involved. And tell yeah. us a little bit about that, and also you know, some of the boards that you, I got on some of them, your experiences with some of the local boards. Well, um, President Hovde and Lytle Free for thought it was important for us to uh, be a part of the community, and Wynn Henschel, who was longtime vice president for. Uh, Purdue Research Foundation was probably our most active member, and uh, I got involved in the uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, and served as president in 1978-79, I guess, and uh, Purdue has always been a big part of United Way, sure. continues to this day. Uh, the single biggest contributor to the local United Way program, and uh, I've been on their board and active in, in that operation. The Community Foundation was started uh, 25 years ago or so, mm -hmm. and I was involved when they started that. Uh, uh, there's always a nucleus of people in that do these things. And uh, Bob Whitzel, who was CEO of Lafayette Life, was one of the community leaders, and and Risk was another one, and uh, uh, people like that, uh, Mick Matag, uh, very key people, and and they helped uh, it gets the keep team. us involved, right. and and. Uh, and we tried to be good neighbors. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. But I think that you notice a change over time. There seems to be more. Of course, with engagement, I think it's, it's broad, yeah. and, it's, and yeah. that has really moved up to the that, front. That's changed it and, and brought a lot more people into the picture. Uh, previously, very few academics were involved in local 
uh, right. activities. Right. And, and now that's not true, and that's a good thing. That's right, exactly. Yeah. Very um, good. True. Um, how about, uh, let's talk a little bit, Board of Trustees. You mentioned yeah. you address a little bit more, but you have a very close relationship yeah. with them. Yes, very close and very excellent over the years. Uh, Purdue's had a long history of having a strong board, and, and I think, it again, it goes back to they're largely Purdue graduates, not exclusively, but largely, and uh, being engineering and science and pharmacy and so on. Um, we had a lot of industrial and business people on the board, and then agriculture. Uh, the state statute required that we have uh, two members from uh, agriculture, two or three, and a woman of character as well. <laughs> I've seen the early bylaws. <laughs> and uh, we've always had a board that. Um, was very strong. They took their responsibilities seriously. Uh, but we've never gotten into internal politics or anything, and they really have never, uh, ever, ever involved themselves in any of the ac academic side. Uh, the things that they know best and can be most helpful, of course, are in the fiscal side and the physical side, the buildings and grounds part of it. And uh, uh, we've had uh, not only a strong board, but we've had strong leaders. Uh, Maury Kanoy, for example, was uh, chairman of the board when I started and, and uh, uh, an outstanding local person who was CEO of Rostone and uh, spent his whole career there. And, uh, Interestingly, uh, had spent some time working with David Ross, so he had the David Ross background, and <clears throat> that's a whole other story about David Ross because he's one of the most important characters of his book, the Proven. Kelly book of right. David Ross is excellent. Yes, I've read that; and, it's very good. Yeah. And I used his priorities and so forth for land acquisition and real estate as, uh, as a guiding principle and, and uh, gave a high priority to that, knowing what benefits the university got from having land available that, <clears throat> in many cases, David Ross personally bought and gave to the university right. when the university couldn't do it for themselves. Mm -hmm. And he, of course, was the one who helped start PRF. R.B. Stewart and, uh, was the administrator, but uh, he provided the money along with Joshua K. Lilly. <coughs> and PRF, by far, is the most important foundation that we've had uh, in our existence. Um, So, um, no. You've had a lot of contact. You keep yeah. very close touch with the yeah. with the board and, and the changes and now the leadership. We've got the Tim leadership Tim McGinley, continues. and he's been in there a long time. Right. And, uh, while our board is, there are three members that are elected by the alumni, and the rest mm -hmm. are appointed by the governor, including a student who was added as a part during my uh, tenure. Uh, still appointed by the governor, um, and um, that's helped stability because the, as governors turn over and change political backgrounds, sure. uh, they tend to appoint people of their own political faith, so you get some turnover, and we're seeing that in the board now. Right. But still, uh, by tradition or uh, just good judgment, uh, governors have uh, always continued the uh, chairman, even if he was not of the same political faith, and and um, and that's been a good thing, and mm -hmm. it's allowed us to have uh, continuity in our uh, overall management. Is the chairman of the board not elected by the board? It's yes, a, it is elected. Oh, by but the then, board. but the governor asked 
Didn't he ask no. McGinn? Oh. He, he appoints the members of the board. But the he, board. He doesn't appoint the chairman. Then there's an election for that. And then that, there's an election within the board. Okay. So, but we've had uh, Maury Canoy and Bob Heine and, and Bob Jesse and Don Powers and now Tim McGinley, uh, all people who have done an outstanding job as chairman of the board and spent a lot, a lot, a lot of time, a lot of effort and uh, provided the uh, overall supervision without getting involved in the nitty-gritty details that, that has kept the university on the straight and narrow path. Right. And, right. Uh, they're the ones that kind of set the tone when they hire a new president and, and of course the Board of Trustees does do the hiring uh, while they have a, a large committee that does the search they come up with four or five candidates and uh, the board then takes over <coughs> and does the interviewing and um, and may choose from that group or may decide not to choose from that group and go back to the search committee and say give us some more names mm -hmm. and uh, and that has happened uh, sometimes but the system has worked very well. Right. Purdue has a remarkable history. When you look at it during the time frame that the 50 years or so that I know about, uh, they've had the right person at the right time. President Hovde, uh, after World War II, when the university was growing so much, uh, <clears throat> uh, he was uh, a very intellectual person, a deep thinker, uh, not the best public speaker in the world because he never wrote it down ahead of time. He thought it through as he was making his speech and if he needed to stop and think about it, he stopped and thought about it and everybody <laughs> kind of waited. <laughs> but uh, he, and he was a great delegator. He'd select good people and then he let them do their work. And uh, so Purdue in the late 40s and through the 50s and 60s, when it went from that big growth, uh, he was the man in charge. And I remember <clears throat> in early in my career, I worked with John Hicks, who was President Hovde's executive assistant. And uh, he was the behind the man scenes man on campus for President Hovde, but he was the leader with the legislature and uh, he would essentially live there during the legislative sessions and I became his gopher and, and worked with him and, and learned an awful lot, but uh, I bet you did. from time to time <clears throat> uh, in the budget pr preparation process uh, uh, with the legislature, they would uh, call the presidents in for a hearing, and, and I remember <coughs> after one session, <coughs> a newsman said, uh, you know, <coughs> when President Hubby gets through speaking, you think if Purdue doesn't get what they need, uh, the Russians will win. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, indeed, Purdue fared very well. Uh, during Hovde's uh, tenure with the legislature. They had great respect for him and uh, they treated us well. Mm -hmm. um, mm. Uh, fundraising, that certainly changed over time, hasn't yes, it? Yes, it has. President Hovde thought that private fundraising should be left to the private universities. And he thought the state should provide the money for state universities. And so he was not a leader in that. Uh, he did allow the Purdue Alumni Foundation to be developed and that was the fundraising arm but the money primarily went to support inter intercollegiate athletics. So a little bit of scholarship support but mostly intercollegiate athletics. But when President Hansen came uh, following President Hovde's retirement, uh, the first thing he did was create the President's Council and, um, and I worked to help develop the Purdue Foundation, which is a fundraising mm -hmm. arm. Um, 
and uh, he started raising money privately and uh, got it really off the ground. Uh, a number of uh, senior industrial people uh, were involved. Just as President Hovde retired, uh, somehow they convinced him to do a fund drive as a part of his retirement, and it was the time when we were uh, celebrating our centennial at Purdue University. So I still have a coffee mug with the logo on it. And I think the, uh, the goal was something like $25 million. <laughs> and Earl Butts was uh, one of the leaders of the fund drive, and uh, we struggled mightily to get to $25 million. And uh, now, of course, we've just completed $1.7 billion <laughs> fund drive. So things have moved quite a bit. Is that one giant and, step? Yeah. From the time that uh, President uh, Hansen got fundraising started, then President Beering came along, and he and his wife Jane just raised it to another level, to use somebody else's term, right. and, uh, and increased fundraising, and also kind of set the scene. And when President Jiski came along, uh, he was just the right guy to go out and, yeah. and reap the benefits that uh, uh, Hansen and Bering had prepared and, and mm -hmm. obviously it was very successful. Right. When the President's Council got started, was it difficult to get, I mean, was there much planning or did, was it Han Dr. Hansen's idea initially? Yes, it oh. was his idea and uh, it started like all things, small, sure. very few people. And uh, Dean Potter, uh, longtime dean of engineering, was still around and alive at that time, and and very much involved in university activities, although long retired. And um, <clears throat> he was urging that they increase the membership to get up to a thousand or something like that. Well, there are many thousand now, and uh, it's proven to be a very successful uh, fundraising mm -hmm. venture. So the credit all goes back to President Hansen in yeah. that beginning. Did the uh, Centennial Fund, did, did, did you meet the 25? I can't remember. Yes, you did, yes. You did meet the, yes, you but I the think goal. we counted everything, including the kitchen sink, to say we, <laughs> we the, got there. Get those <laughs> zeros there, right? <laughs> Fundraisers have a way of doing those things. <laughs> get those, add those zeros on there. Right. Um, Usually I ask one question, or we've been asking people, diversity, how that has changed over time in the university. Yes. Um, yeah. When I was a student, there were very few black students. I think there was one in my mechanical engineering class, and, uh, and no women. Uh, there, uh, and in my master's program, there were no women and no black students. Um, and that was late 50s. So. Since then, things have evolved. Uh, one of the areas that started under the uh, Lytle Freehafer, the uh, Black Cultural Center, and uh, uh, continued while I was here, and now it's been transferred to be under the provost, but uh, one of our big projects was to raise money to build the new Black Cultural Center. Sure, right. That went well, and with the President's help, we got it done. Mm -hmm. and, uh, That's a nice facility. And now they, they have several other uh, cultural centers, I understand, that have evolved and are growing and mm -hmm. going through the same process that the Black sure. Cultural Center did. So, right. yes, it's changing, and, and the faculty has changed likewise. Now, not only uh, male and female and, and uh, but in terms of the number of foreign-born faculty, uh, a lot more now than right. there used to be. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how about the Indiana Commission of Higher Education uh, and the General Assembly? You had relations with them. Yes, uh, mostly starting out through John Hicks. And, um, the Indiana Commission was 
uh, a brainchild of John Hicks. He wrote the legislation, <laughs> and uh, I got to be part of that activity. And um, it was uh, born out of the fear that the legislature might adopt a Board of Regents, which would eliminate our Board of Trustees and just have one essentially Board of Regents over all the universities in the state of Indiana. And uh, IU didn't want that either. Uh, so uh, John Hicks wrote the legislation and got it introduced and, and it passed. And a very specific item in there uh, prohibits the uh, commission from being involved in day-to-day -day activities. And uh, that was, has proven to be very useful as John knew it would be <laughs> when, he, when he wrote it. And uh, they have acted as a, kind of a neutral party in the relationship with the legislature. And, and it's been both bad and good. Um, it's been bad in that the universities don't have quite as close a relationship with the legislature as they did prior to that. And, and our, our relationship used to be through the budget state budget office. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when we went down there, we hung our hat in the budget office uh, when we were going to the legislative activities and so forth. And we're always very close to the director. Uh, Lytle Freehafer, of course, was a former budget state budget director. And... Uh, now the the commission kind of comes in between the university and the uh, legislature, although we still have direct inter interactions with them. It's just slightly different, and, and it's another level of bureaucracy. Fortunately, uh, they kind of started with academic programs where they are today, and they didn't force anybody to get rid of anything, uh, and they've approved all new academic programs, and uh, that's not proven to be too big a burden. Uh, they've added some bureaucracy as far as the uh, approval of capital new building projects and major R&R &R repair and rehabilitation projects, but we always thought that was uh, fine because it kept them occupied and out of some of the other things that they might be doing that could be more troublesome. So overall, I think it served a, its original purpose. We still don't have a Board of Regents in Indiana. And the commission is, uh, the universities still have significant political uh, involvement with the legislature, not, not Republican-Democrat politics, but relationships. And uh, and that's important. Mm -hmm. And then you, 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 your contacts with the Indiana General Assembly or the researchers. Would you have what were your contacts? Uh, or what nature? Of, if it, when you touch base with them or? Well, as Andrew? John Hicks always carefully explained, we're here to answer questions and provide information, okay. and that's all we did. And Very good. We nice worked with the leadership of uh, both houses all the time closely. Um, the state budget committee would come to campus to visit, and I think they were here just uh, last week, maybe, or maybe it's this week. Um, and that would be a chance to show them things. They'd give them campus tours. Uh, Do they visit all the campuses? Yes. Of all the, well, of uh, the major, major states, state schools or universities? Universities, yes. Uh, and they meet on some of the regional campuses as well from mm -hmm. time to time. Um, I remember the one of the last ones I had before I retired, uh, we took them on a tour through those FWA buildings <laughs> when we were trying to get money to uh, build a new creative arts Show building. Show and tell always works. Yeah, and they came away agreeing that we needed to replace those buildings. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure they took them on a similar tour just different facilities when they were here. <laughs> I hear you. Um, TIA and CREF, yes. how much your experience with that when well, you were elected? I really enjoyed that. Um, 
I never enjoyed New York City so much, which is where their headquarters is, but uh, it was just by chance and through my activities with NACUBO, the National Association of College and University Business Officers, I met the chairman of the board of TIA, CREF, and uh, he invited me to come on the board. And uh, at that time, the state statute was such that I couldn't do it. And uh, it happened at the same time that uh, some other things were happening, and, and the legislature changed the statute just at the right time for me. It wasn't for me. They didn't know about my problem. And uh, the chairman was uh, nice enough to hold that offer open. And so after they changed the statute, uh, I joined the, uh, the TIA board. There's actually two different boards, TIA and CREF. I served on TIA for approximately 20 years. So. About every other month for 20 years, I went to New York City for a di two days, and, and uh, is that an appointment and not an elected office or it, on the board? It's really an appointment to TIA. Okay. Uh, the participants vote, but their vote is a recommendation. Uh, they don't directly vote. For CREF, it was a direct vote, so it was an election. But for TIA, it was an appointment. So mm -hmm. I was appointed, and, and um, I uh, enjoyed that. Uh, I had troubles with the zeros <laughs> uh, because everything was in hundreds of millions of dollars and billions of dollars. And when I retired, I think they were over $180 billion. Uh, in total assets and uh, many similarities with Purdue. They're very conservatively managed, uh, had a long history of that. Uh, uh, previous chairman of the board before the guy that Hart that brought me on uh, was a former IU uh, administrator under Herman Wells. Uh, so there were some ties there. Um, and it, I think, and it continues today, although it's a little different than it was then, uh, to be a combination on the board of, of financial people from the New York Wall Street area and academic people. And uh, there were, I was the only business officer on the TIA board, and there was a business officer on the craft board and uh, what would be the composition of the of the board is it a cross section of different professions and well mostly uh, distinguished professors of economics okay. and finance and business mm -hmm. uh, no historians <laughs> uh, a couple of presidents and then the Wall Street types. Okay. Yeah. Kind of a, a different mix. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the Wall Streeters would get kind of annoyed with the academics when they wanted to discuss things in great <laughs> detail and <laughs> wanted to get on with business and get out of there. And um, <laughs> so, but it it worked very well, and it, today uh, it continues to work well although the nature has changed a little bit and they've reorganized and shrunk the boards and tried to make it a little more efficient. Um, we had 22 members of TIA and 22 members of CREF, so when you have 44 members of a board, a and, they, and we met most of the time in combined session, that, that was a lot of people and it was difficult to have right. good discussions. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, TI CREF has proved to be uh, a wonderful uh, retirement vehicle for faculty and staff of most colleges and universities. And it's kind of interesting now that business and industry is scrapping what they've used as a retirement program and they're adopting through the 401k right. the same kind of program that universities have had since 1918. Right. <laughs> exactly.
One of the interesting things is uh, there was a change, the fact that we have more options now as far yes. as the retirement, yes. and that was not the case for a long time. Is that correct? No, that's right, and I was right in the middle of that. Oh, really? Uh, when I came on, that was the hot issue. And the first uh, new uh, option we offered was a money market, <laughs> so people could get in and out on their CREF. And then following that, we opened it up to a number of programs. And, and then it got to be an argument about not having too many, because some of the big uh, mutual fund companies like Fidelity have thousands of different, and you can't possibly look at those and make good decisions. Make decisions. So right. uh, I'm glad they uh, kept it. Uh, conservative and kept a reasonable number of choices, and, but it now allows people to do um, put their money where they think it should be, sure. including a socially responsible program, which sometimes outperforms the other market. Interestingly enough, not not most of the time, but sometimes. And <clears throat> the one thing that did really seriously worry me was the option to withdraw your money completely on retirement, and I was afraid that uh, possibly some people would withdraw it and then in their later stages of life, uh, when they might be thinking less clearly, be subject to fraud or something, mm -hmm. uh, somebody could take advantage of them and, and they'd be uh, destitute because for most faculty and university staff, that's the main source of income. All right. yeah. and, uh, but I'm sure it's happened, but it hasn't happened in any numbers enough that it's gotten any sure. publicity. Right. And I'm very glad of that that's right. because that was worrisome to me. Right. I would think so. You were very kind and your Vita gave some awards, but a couple of ones, you got an honorary doctorate, but a couple yes. of other awards make some comments on how some of them came about or your reaction to them. You got a Sagamore as well, right? Well. I have actually got two, <laughs> oh, okay. and uh, yes, that that came about through the board of trustees, and uh, and ultimately the honorary doctorate was approved by the board, but it was initiated by the school of management and and Bob Ringel, uh, provost at that time, and uh, that's probably my greatest honor, uh, other than the. Uh, fact that the trustees have named the dining court uh, yes. for Mary and myself, and that, that probably is my greatest honor. Uh, on the Sagamores, you got them from different governors? Yes. Did you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, did, how did, tell us how did you, did they give you a call, or how did it come about? No, it was through the Board of oh, Trustees. Oh, the Board, I and, see. Okay. And okay. <clears throat> the Board, oh, made as the I said earlier, each, okay. uh, uh, all but three of the me board members are appointed by the governor, so okay. some of them were fairly close with sure. the governor. Right. And uh, uh, the board honored me at uh, one point in my milestone in my history with Purdue, and and I got uh, a Sagamore then, and then a, one when I retired. Right. So yeah. that's why. I have to it's interesting on the Sagamore. There's no list anywhere kept of. Who has them? Who has yeah. them? <laughs> and you know because well, and this governor has stopped, right. literally stopped. I have doing a colleague that. who got one, mm -hmm. and w we tried to look into it, and we found the same thing that others did. There's no list kept anywhere, which right. some people like to know. Maybe they don't want to keep track. I got one from this one and that yeah. one. I don't know, but there's no list available. Yeah. Well, I th <laughs> think there might be some. You could probably spend reason some time for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I gave him two. I didn't know that. <laughs> right. uh, no, and I, I received an award from the uh, Nakubo, the National Association, as a distinguished business officer. And when your colleagues elect you to something like that, that's always nice. And I enjoyed that. Yes, yeah. that's right. Um, uh, you're, have you been participating? Do you participate in alumni activities as an alumnus of Purdue, or the Alumni Association? Do you have any office? Or Not yeah. so much okay. directly with the Alumni Association, but I continue with the President's Council, and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Mary and I have included the university in our estate plan and, and things like that, and then I'm 
chairman of the class of 1958 fund drives. So. I was going to ask you, uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, that came about interestingly as I was getting ready to retire. I went to a Purdue uh, affair for the class of 58 and uh, at Gala Week, I think, and, and uh, um, I got nominated to chair this found, uh, fundraising activity, and it seemed to be far enough off in the future, and I obviously would need something to do in my retirement, so I said yes, and, and then we got started, and, <laughs> and my wife Mary is uh, from the class of 59, and, and we are uh, friends with some other people like Ron Fruitt, who's also class of 59, and, and Ben Miller. And uh, we got talking about it, and we got focused on that uh, avenue. Uh, originally, it was going to be the avenue of the astronauts uh, and uh, on the mall that leads up to Cary Hall. And uh, then the cost of that got a little high, and in the meantime, uh, President Jiski arrived and started this $1.3 billion campaign, and we decided that <clears throat> our campaign had to be more modest <laughs> in view of his uh, focus. So uh, we we settled on the gateway at the head end of that mall, and uh, someone came up with the idea of naming it the Gateway to the Future, which I thought was a a catchy name for it, and uh, it will be impressive. And after we had decided that, they decided uh, to put the Neil Armstrong building right beside it, which is nice. And so it will, uh, it'll be very large. It's almost two stories high, <laughs> and uh, two limestone pillars with an arch across that says Purdue University. And uh, with any luck at all, we'll take bids uh, next month in October and uh, construction next spring. We've completed the fund drive and it's oversubscribed, so we're in good shape. We're devoting the extra monies to uh, uh, student scholarships. Uh, so uh, we'll have both the Gateway and endowed scholarships for both the class of 59 and the class of 58 as a Very part nice. of that. So yeah. uh, when is it, to, uh, we have the dedicate, is that going to be in 08 or? 08. 08. Uh, and the homecoming of 08. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sounds good. Let me talk a little about your, your, your uh, mention about your family. You, you met your wife here? Yes. And uh, you have children and? We have three children. One is a Professor of Political Science at uh, College of Charleston in Charleston, South Carolina, and she has uh, a son and a daughter. And then uh, we have a son, uh, Stephen, who's an artist um, and uh, lives in Philadelphia and uh, designs and sells jewelry uh, with a part business partner and has a a warehouse that they've converted and renovated for artsy type people to have studios in. And then we have a younger daughter, uh, Kathy, who is our only Purdue graduate, and uh, she's uh, married and lives in uh, Great Falls, Virginia, and has three children. Mm. And so uh, all of our kids are on the East Coast. So, but they're lined up so we can make a circle, <laughs> and that's a little bit easier. That's nice. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Uh, any uh, any other things you've been involved in in your retirement? Just enjoying. Life? Well, I've gotten involved uh, in our church. We have a foundation, and Bob Whitzel, uh, a local icon, used to be the chairman of the investment committee, and he passed away, and. They asked me to take that over, so I'm doing that. And, and then one of the Purdue trustees who's involved with the Westminster Retirement 
uh, operation uh, asked me to get involved with their investment committee, so I'm involved with that now. And uh, sounds good. That's that's pretty much my that uh, and doing formal a little traffic. activities. Right. And <laughs> I have a, a summer cottage up in Lake Maxincucky at Culver, so I go sailing in the summer and. We have a place in Florida in Everglades City, and I do fishing in the winter. So I tell people, fishing is a winter sport for me. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. How about one of your longest memories of Purdue? you have one of those? A long memory of Purdue? Oh, my undergraduate student days, uh, memories of things like homecoming that, that used to, we built homecoming displays and things like that. And, um, and spending a lot of time uh, last minute studying for exams. And we didn't have finals and didn't have final week back then, so it was different. And, uh, and of course the, uni the campus was all open. You could drive any place you wanted to go on campus. And, and uh, it was quite different. Mm -hmm. uh, the The physical facilities change is is one that both I have a great interest in and and was heavily involved in during my career. I built some twenty one new facilities, and uh, especially the the mall in front of what used to be uh, the executive building, now Hovde Hall. Uh, some people were very upset when we put that uh, MSCE building across the end and shut off the traffic. And now that the design has matured and all the trees have, have grown uh, and the fountain, uh, most people think it's okay. Uh, some of them still don't like it, <laughs> but it's part of changing the access and, and shutting off the campus for vehicular traffic. Um, and then we created the mall over by the old education building. Um, that was one that, that I created newly. It, it did not exist. It was a parking lot before we built uh, what's now the Beering Building. And uh, as a part of that building, we designed that mall and, and moved the fountain from the, in front of Hovde Hall over there because we needed a bigger fountain in front of Hovde Hall, a bigger presence. So, and then uh, I guess from very early days of working at Purdue, uh, I remember from my freshman year, that behind the Union and the Stewart Center was all open. Well, Stewart Center wasn't there. It was the, I've forgotten the name of the building, uh, Fowler Hall and, uh, and the library. And they tore Fowler Hall down and wrapped Stewart Center around the library. But then they made that big parking lot. It was really ugly and so on. So I had a goal to get rid of that. And, and we did. <laughs> and uh, most of the parking's gone. My only regret is I, if I had to do it over again, I'd take some more parking out of it. But <laughs> it, it looks nice, and, and it ties nicely into the mall where John Perdue's grave is. Right, yes. That works out well. Uh, there was a period of time when, when people were complaining bitterly about Perdue's reg red brick buildings and the way they looked and it was dull and, and uninteresting and uh, we thought about it a while and said well 80 percent of the buildings are built and we're not going to tear them down uh, the only way we can change it is with the landscaping so that's when we made focus on creating areas of interest and John Collier has been a a great contributor to that uh, in the physical facilities, and landscape design, and uh, made a real difference. And right. People have generally uh, been very complimentary about the, 
appearance of the campus. Same same buildings. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just different landscaping. Right. One of the things that do is the bell tower. That's really yes. uh, very people are ama amazed at that. It's wonderful. You can see it from the distance. You right. know, people. Even mm -hmm. I've talked to people who've come yeah. here the first time, and that's the first thing they see yes. coming over the bridge. It's, it really there, has enhanced there's it. There's a story there too. How, of course, it's what? across the street from the old power plant. And we used to have a chimney that went up even higher than the bell tower, which you could see from everywhere, which people suggested that sometimes students late at night needed some guidance back to campus and they could see that chimney and it was lighted because of the airport and had to be lighted. Mm -hmm. um, but when we closed it down, of course, it started corroding inside, and it was eventually going to fall down, so we had to tear it down. And we came up with the idea of the bell tower, and the bell tower was supposed to come up as the chimney came down. Well, it, we took bids the first time, and the bids were higher than the estimate by a big amount, and we had to go back to the drawing boards and, and also find some more money. In the meantime, the chimney got torn down, so... People were a bit unhappy about that, but we rebid it and got some extra money, and and uh, I think it's a nice campus it is. landmark. Very nice, yes. And yeah. Any uh, outstanding event in your life? Well, I've had a lot of them. <laughs> I've been very lucky. And, okay. Uh, uh, That's a nice thing. My. Uh, I tell people that the two most important decisions I made in my life was to come to Purdue as a student and to marry Mary Harrison. Uh, and <clears throat> those are the biggest events in my life. And Very nice. Everything and else is history. <laughs> any questions that I failed to ask that you would care to comment on well, in closing? I guess uh, the thing that I would talk any more about would be facilities okay. and one of the things that has been disturbing to me and and others as well lately the focus has been uh, on new buildings because we want to uh, <clears throat> increase the square footage on campus especially for research and uh, and the campaign of course and and people like to get their names on buildings and things like that. So uh, a lot of money has been focused on new construction and at the same time the state's uh, economics has have not been good and the first thing they cut out when the legislature cuts out when the, uh, any kind of revenue shortfalls at the state level is uh, repair and rehabilitation appropriations. And, it's a separate line item appropriation. And it, it's never been enough. Uh, we developed a formula. Uh, it, it used to be that you went to the legislature with a handful of projects, uh, repair projects, and every university threw them on the table. And then somehow the legislature was supposed to set priorities and, and make sense out of that and, and give us each the right number of dollars. Well, that didn't work very well because it, it was an impossible task. So um, Walt Wade, who was then director of the physical plant, uh, and I came up with a formula, which we stole from Michigan, that <clears throat> we convinced the other state universities to use. And that formula then allocated the repair and rehabilitation money between the campuses. We presented it to the budget committee and the legislature and they liked it because it was an easy way to... So all they had to do, <clears throat> we came up with, uh, with uh, uh, the formula amounts and the totals <coughs> and then the legislature decided how much in total they were going to give to the universities and then the formula said how the money was going to be divided between IU and Purdue and Ball State and Indiana State and so on. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and that worked reasonably well, but 
in only about one year that I can remember did they ever fully fund the formula. And so you were always behind and and then in years when they didn't give any money, you really got behind. And uh, Purdue's had some of that time and, and uh, I used to be able to take other monies and, and try to fill in in those low spots, but that other money then got diverted to help build the new buildings. So uh, the repair and renovation of buildings is a top priority and, and the trustees have recognized this and, and now the General Assembly has approved a, uh, a special uh, statute that allows Purdue to charge extra student fee money that can be devoted to repair and rehabilitation. And so that's being just implemented now. And so in the next few years, there's going to be some, a lot of catch up <laughs> done. And uh, I think that's very, very important. Uh, back in the days I told you about the formula we developed for the legislature, we also developed a master plan on campus. So we had a 10-year repair and rehabilitation master plan that covered all of the academic buildings. And there was a classroom segment, and a teaching lab segment, and a research lab, and, and offices. And, uh, and then <clears throat> we, uh, we allocated our money based on priorities. So I had committees to review the classrooms and come up with uh, what, what were our poorest maintained classrooms. And we only had about 250 or 60 classrooms. And Jim Blakesley, who managed schedules and space, did a fantastic job. But there was never any extra space. So uh, we could only take a couple of classrooms out of circulation at a time. and and renovate them and so we we do that and then do a couple more and a couple more and over a period of time you can, you can make good progress and uh, that uh, proved to be a good uh, good management tool to uh, uh, maintain the campus uh, one of the other things that started I don't know under R.B. Stewart probably but Vital free for for sure was keeping the campus clean, and it's always been a tradition that even uh, early Sunday morning after a home football game, you go out on campus and it's clean. And uh, during the week, you walk on campus and it's clean. There's not trash all over the place and so on. Sometimes people suggested to me maybe we ought to have a little trash around the legislature and feel more sorry for us and give us more money, but I never thought that was a good way to convince the legislature to give us more money. Um, and things like that have been uh, curtailed a bit because of the shortfall in funds, and I hope they'll be reinstituted. Right. Uh, it's. Uh, something that uh, particularly the older faculty and when uh, I talk to them uh, lament that back in the good old days we used used to be cleaner used to be better maintained and so forth of course as you get older a lot of things used to be a lot better <laughs> <laughs> uh, any, anything in closing dr ford that you'd like to no you've dinner? covered the topics very well i think and uh, I've just been very fortunate to be at Purdue at a period of time when uh, we had a lot of opportunity to, to do things and, uh, and have things happen. And uh, Purdue is a wonderful institution. I'm very fortunate to have that educational background. And I enjoy going around uh, meeting other Purdue alumni and most of them feel the same way. Right. Every once in a while you meet somebody that doesn't, but uh, well, you can never make everybody happy. That adds to the mix sometimes, yeah, I think. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. I discovered a long time ago that if you, as a chief business officer, uh, you 
had to not be a kind of person who uh, wanted to be loved by everybody, because <laughs> that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> Oh, I want to thank you, Dr. Ford, very oh, much. I've okay. really enjoyed this. I've thank you. This concludes it too. my pleasure. Thank you.